Welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, and this is the recap of Trial Day 14 in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts versus Karen Reed Case. Grab your red solo cups, pour yourself a drink, and let's recap. Yesterday, we ended the day with Matt McCabe describing how he woke up in the early morning hours of January 29th, 2022. This is where we started today's testimony. He said shortly before 5 a.m. he woke up because he heard a woman's voice screaming his wife's name, Jen, over and over. In his grogginess, he thought it was somebody in his room and probably one of his daughters. Once he awakened more, he realized it was somebody on the phone with Jen. He didn't recognize the person's voice, but he asked Jen what was going on. She told him that she was on the phone with Karen. He learned that Karen couldn't find John and that the last time she saw him was at the waterfall call ended after a minute or two. He said he told Jen that he thought Karen was crazy in saying she last saw John at Waterfall because he saw the black SUV pull up to 34 Fairview after everyone left Waterfall. Jen had started calling other people who were with them last night, but nobody answered any of the calls. Jen spoke with Karen again, and the witness said that they told Karen they saw her car on Fairview, to which Karen replied that she didn't remember going there. He said in another subsequent call with with the defendant, while he and Jen were still in their bedroom, Karen blurted out that she broke her taillight. He said he and Jen were totally confused about where John was. John allegedly had mentioned possibly going to meet up with another individual, so they tried calling that person, but nobody answered the calls. He said they got dressed and went downstairs. They were getting ready to leave the house to drive to the place where they thought John could have gone, but in that moment, He heard yelling outside in his front yard. It was Karen Reed. It was at least a half hour after that initial phone call. She was yelling for Jen. The witness, he was relieved at that point because he didn't have to go outside to go hunt down John. His wife and Karen were on the case. He said he was concerned, though, with the fact that they would be driving around in the snow in Karen's car that had a broken taillight. He thought the taillight was out, not physically broken. Nevertheless, they left in Karen's car, and the witness watched the whole thing from his bedroom window. The witness said that when Jen and Karen left the house to go look for John, he called and texted John to ask where he was and to let him know the ladies were going out to look for him. He did not receive a response or speak with John. He next spoke to Jen about an hour later when she called to tell him that they found John and that she was at Fairview. The witness finished getting dressed and drove over to Fairview. When he got there, he had to maneuver around to get close to 34 Fairview because of the first responder vehicles that were in the street. He ran into Carrie Roberts on the street who told him that she was going to drop Karen off. She was going to the hospital and was going to pick up John's parents. He offered to go with Carrie to pick up John's parents, but she told him that Jen was inside the house being interviewed by the police. So he left Carrie and went to the house. When he got inside, Brian and Nicole Albert his wife, Jen, and Sergeant Lank were there. He said that everyone looked in shock. From prior moments of crises, the witness described his wife, Jen, as having a calm demeanor in those moments, in those critical moments. He said that Lank asked him to step outside, where Lank asked him if he knew what happened to John and when he last saw John. The witness said he had no idea what happened to John, that he last saw him at the waterfall, and that he saw the car that John was in outside 34 Fairview the night before, but never saw him inside the house. After speaking with Sergeant Lank, the witness stayed at 34 Fairview for about four hours that morning, then went back home. Back at home at some point, two state troopers visited him, Proctor and Buchanan. The witness had never met them before. They asked to speak with Jen alone, and he went to his bedroom. When they interviewed him, he said Jen wasn't in the room with them. He said Brian Albert Sr. came over to the house and he spoke with the troopers too. The witness was in his bedroom during Brian's interview and he wasn't sure where Jen was. A couple of days later, he spoke with additional troopers, one of whose name is Connor. They came to his house and spoke with him and Jen again separately. On cross-examination, the defense confirmed that the mood at Waterfall was festive and happy, that John and and Karen were in good moods, that he did not think they were drinking much. They were only there for about an hour before the bar closed, and the bar is pretty strict about last calls. 
The witness confirmed Brian Albert and Brian Higgins' presence at the waterfall that night, and he remembered seeing them playing grab ass, as he called it. The witness said that when they arrived at 34 Fairview, Jen parked their car in the driveway. There were already cars in the driveway, but he doesn't remember ex the exact spot that they parked in. When they arrived, the black SUV was nowhere to be found, but the Jeep with a snowplow in the front of it, owned by Brian Higgins, was parked in front of the mailbox on the street. It was not blocking the driveway, and there were no tire tracks in the street in front of the Jeep. After about five minutes after getting inside the house, Matt looked outside and saw the black SUV on the street directly lined up in front of the front door, more or less. He also saw the Jeep with the snowplow in the same spot as earlier. The witness was asked multiple times in different ways whether he told Trooper Proctor on January 29th that looking out of the house, he saw the dark SUV parked to the right of the house and then subsequently saw it on the other side of the property line. Matt denied that statement and maintained that the first time he saw the SUV, it was directly in front of the house and subsequent times he saw the SUV had moved to the right. Now, I know I mentioned the judge before and questioned some bias in her rulings, but at th this was a point where I again questioned her admonishing the defense to move on from the topic. Defense was trying to nail down the witness's testimony about positions he observed the dark SUV in and compare what the witness was saying today to what he previously said in grand jury testimony and what was written in Trooper Proctor's report. I could see where counsel was going with the line of questioning, and I hope the jury saw it as well, because I think the point was that Proctor's report did not reflect the exact information that the witness testified to in this trial and possibly the grand jury testimony. As much as this case is dragging, I didn't agree with the judge limiting counsel's questions because he was trying to point out the inconsistencies. Back to the testimony. The defense asked him, since speaking with Proctor the day of the incident, whether the witness spoke with other people about the case. The witness admitted that he's had multiple conversations about the case with all his family. Well, given that, the defense asked him to acknowledge that his testimony changed since his interview with Proctor. Matt admitted that he never saw any damage to the SUV's taillights. Yesterday, he testified about where tire tracks in the snow. So today, he acknowledged that the tracks could have been consistent with a three-point turn. When he noticed the tire tracks, there were no other cars lining the Albert's house other than the Jeep and the SUV. They next discussed the phone calls between Jen and John after leaving the waterfall. How they gave the address and general directions to John, and then in the second call, gave John more specific directions. The witness said that he fully expected John to show up at 34 Fairview based on those calls. He was shown a picture of a map of Fairview and its cross streets. Per the directions, they told John the direction John would have been traveling in would have resulted in the house being on the left side of the street. So the witness testified that a three-point turn would have positioned the car so that the house was on their right passenger side, which was consistent with how he observed the SUV when he saw it. The witness admitted that since he could look out from the house and see the tire tracks on the street, that he'd also be able to see the front lawn. He never saw John in the vehicle, never saw John laying in the snow, never saw a car crash, never heard any loud noise or any noise from outside that attracted his attention. When leaving the house around 1.45, he left with his wife, Julie Nagel, and Sarah Levinson. When he exited the house, the SUV was gone. He never saw a baseball cap, shards of broken taillight, or a body on the lawn. He does not recall running back into the house to retrieve a forgotten item like Julia testified. When he backed out of the driveway, he turned the car to drive the length of the Alberts' property. He did not hear Julie Nagel say anything about a black object, a black blob, seeing something weird, any five to six foot long object, and he wasn't wearing any ear cancellation device, and his hearing is just fine. Because he did not hear her say anything, he never stopped the car. 
The next morning, he recalled how hysterical Karen was when she called Jen and when she got to his house. Fast forwarding, the defense asked the witness about a group chat with Jen, Brian and Nicole Albert, and himself that was started in the days after the 29th. The witness denied remembering being at the Albert house on February 1st, but then he was shown a photo of what looked like a text exchange and admitted to texting the group, quote, troopers are back out front, but in front of the Asian house, close quote. He testified that an Asian family lived next door to 34 Fairview. They all knew who the witness was talking about. Brian Albert responded, quote, right now, close quote. The witness confirmed and told the group he was trying to get a picture of the scene. He testified that he happened to be driving down the street, Fairview, when he saw the troopers, but he refused to admit that he was monitoring their actions. We saw the text messages in court, and we also saw more group chats where they're discussing Carrie Roberts and her interviewing with Proctor, and another discussion where the witness texted the group to tell Chris Albert to say, quote, the guy never went in the house, close quote. The witness said that the guy he was referring to was John O'Keefe. Brian Albert responded to that message from the witness with one word, exactly. On redirect, the witness said that he spoke with his family and friends about John because nobody knew what happened to him. He said he never told anybody what to say to investigators. He said on the day he drove down Fairview and saw the troopers at the neighboring property, he was using the street as a, a through street. He said it looked like there was more snow dug out at the property. On recross, he was asked about the text message where he told the group what to say in light of his testimony on recross that he never told anybody what to say. He testified that in the text message, he was telling the group to tell Channel 4, not investigators, that John never came into the house. The next witness was Jennifer McCabe. She and her husband, Matt, went to the waterfall to meet her sister, Nicole, at 9 p.m. We heard much the same background information that's already been introduced, so I'll spare you. She said she was very friendly with Karen once they met in the summer of July 2020. They connected over their MS diagnoses and the kids. She also, she also considered John a good friend of hers. Her testimony was consistent with other testimony about their time at Waterfall. She saw Karen with her glass of clear liquid that we've heard about, but she didn't remember Karen drinking anything else. She recounted a conversation she had with Karen about a disagreement she and John had over taking the kids to Dunkin' Donuts because he thought the kids would end up trying to make it a habit. The witness described it as just girlfriend to girlfriend venting about normal kid raising issues. In leaving the waterfall, she walked out with Karen and Karina Kolakithis. Matt and John were still inside the bar so she suggested that Karen drive to 34 Fairview with her because she didn't know how long Matt would be inside the bar. John came out the bar and she, Karen, and John spoke for a minute, confirming they would go to 34 Fairview, then parted ways to get in their respective vehicles. Once Matt came out and got in the car that she was driving, she got a text from John asking for the address. She called John instead of texting back and gave him the info she, that he needed. When he called back a few minutes later, they gave him additional directions in relation to a mutual friend of their girl's house. So a landmark they both knew. When she arrived at 34 Fairview, she parked in the driveway and went inside where she saw everybody. She did not see Colin and never saw John or Karen at the house. She said when Julie went outside to talk to her brother, her nephew Brian Jr. mentioned another car being outside, after which the witness went to the front door. She said she saw a dark SUV on the street directly in front of the front door. Its red taillights and headlights were on, so she knew the car was running. She noticed headlights off to the left. That presumably was from the truck that Ryan Nagel was in. The witness recognized the dark SUV as one consistent with Karen Reed's car. She never saw anyone leave the vehicle. 
When she made these observations, she texted John's phone saying, quote, here at 1227. At 1231, she texted John's phone again, quote, pull behind me because she said the SUV had moved from the spot she saw it previously. So she was telling him to park behind her car that was in the driveway. At 1240, she sent another text to John saying, hello, but she can't remember if they were still out front or if they had left. At 1242, she texted John again, where are you? And hello, again at 1245. She never received any response to her texts. At 4.59 a.m., she texted John, quote, please answer. And then, quote, Karen is worried. We need to find you. Then at 5.04 a.m., she texted, quote, please answer so I know you're okay. Again, she received no response. The witness was shown her call records from that night. The records show the calls between the witness and John at 1214 and 1218. Those are the ones after leaving Waterfall. And then a final call at 525 a.m., which was Jen calling John. The witness identified on photographs where she saw the dark SUV. The first time it was directly in front of the front door, and the next position she saw it in was in the area of the flagpole. She said she assumed they decided not to come in because maybe they got in an argument or maybe his niece had called them needing them at home. When the witness was leaving 34 Fairview, she turned her body in the seat to better speak with the girls who were in the back seat. After dropping off the girls, they headed home. The witness got into bed first and her husband, Matt, followed a few minutes later. She asked Matt to watch some TV, but he passed, so she got on her phone and started scrolling. She said she started researching a basketball team for her daughter and texted her sisters and texted in another group chat. She fell asleep after that. At 4.53, she woke up to her phone ringing. It was John's niece, Kaylee, who told her that John didn't come home and Karen needed to talk to her. The witness said that Karen was screaming her name and told her that John didn't come home, that they had gotten into a fight, so she left him at the waterfall. The witness was confused, but remember that, that Chris was slow in leaving the bar, so she thought maybe John left with Chris. So she told Karen that she would call Julie, Chris's wife, to find out from Chris if he knew where John was. She hung up to dial Julie. In the interim, Matt, her husband, got up, figured out what was happening, and told the witness that they had seen the that they had seen Karen's vehicle outside 34 Fairview the night before. Remembering that, the witness disconnected the call to Julie. The witness gets back in touch with Karen and tells her that she was seen on Fairview, and Karen replied that she didn't remember being there. And then she started asking, did I hit him? Could I have hit him? Then told the witness that she had a broken taillight. The witness said Karen was screaming, acting irrational the whole time, and said, quote, oh my God, I left him there. She was all over the place. The witness started thinking where John could possibly be and had heard that someone named Tom Beatty was maybe supposed to have met John at the bar, but never did. The witness thought maybe John had met up with Tom after leaving the bar, so she called Tom, but he didn't answer. She decided to drive over to Tom's house, so she got dressed and went downstairs. At that point, she started hearing Karen screaming for her. Karen was outside and she was yelling, Jen, 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 and she was yelling, did I hit him? Could I have hit him? Karen was running up the witness's walkway. Jen got to the door and tried quieting her down. She told her she would go with her to look for John. As they walked out, a car pulled up and behind that car, there was a snowplow. In the car was Carrie Roberts, who rolled down her window and yelled out to Karen. The witness had met Carrie once before, but she wasn't anybody that she was friends with. The witness told Karen that she would drive Karen's car because Karen was hysterical. The witness and Karen got into Karen's car and Carrie called Karen's phone. The decision was made for all three of them to drive back to John's house. 
Carrie Roberts followed behind them. The witness says that when they got to John's house and parked, Karen pulled the ladies over to the rear of the vehicle to show them the cracked right taillight. The witness said she saw missing pieces from the light. They didn't, out, they didn't, they didn't stay outside long. Carrie ushered them inside the house so they could look for John. We saw a photo of the tail end of the defendant's car in what looked to be a police garage. The broken tail light was evident and prominent. The witness confirmed that the state of the car depicted in the picture was what she also saw early that morning. Next, we saw security footage from John's ring camera. It showed a snowy scene of the women exiting Karen's car and Carrie's car behind pulling, pulling up in John's driveway. Now, I was second guessing myself, so I went back to rewatch this because I wondered if I was tripping, but they showed a video of the ladies getting out of the car, but they all made a beeline directly into the house. There was no stopping to look at taillights. There was no congregating at the back of Karen's car. In fact, the witness was seen getting out of the driver's seat and not even walking towards the back of the car. They just made a beeline directly to the house. So I'm not sure if everybody saw what I saw, but that video did not match up to the witness's testimony. She said when they got there, the right garage door was open, which was not typical. She and Carrie took off their shoes as per custom of the house, but Karen did not. They dispersed throughout the house looking for John. The witness had a brief conversation with Kaylee, John's niece, who told her that her brother was at a sleepover. The witness promised Kaylee that she would find John and that everything would be okay. After looking throughout the house, the three ladies got into Carrie's car and drove to Fairview because Karen kept screaming that that was where they needed to go. So the women were all in Carrie's car driving to Fairview. It took about 10 minutes to get there. Karen was in the back seat in the middle. The witness said Karen was screaming both of their names repeatedly and also repeating the same phrases over and over. Could I have hit him? Did I have hit him? Did I hit him? Could I have hit him? Carrie was trying to get Karen to shut up and the witness was looking out both sides of the vehicle, trying to spot where John may be. The witness said Karen was asking if John could have been at the house of a friend that lived close to the Alberts. She said that as they got closer to 34 Fairview, she had to tell Carrie where the house was. They passed the property line and all of a sudden, Karen started screaming, there he is, there he is, and banging on the door to get out. Jen said she had not seen John laying on the ground, but Karen got out of the car and made a beeline over to John. The witness said she froze. She couldn't believe what she was seeing. Then her and Carrie made eye contact. She testified that she saw Karen get over to John and basically fling her body on top of John's, assumedly trying to warm him up. The witness then called 911 and ran to the back of the vehicle to get a blanket or something warm to put over John. The witness saw Carrie wiping the snow off of John's face. He was flat on his back. His body was covered in snow. Jen ran the blankets over to Carrie. She was trying to be calm. Carrie yelled to start doing CPR and start mouth to mouth. The witness had to step away from them because it was so loud. When the witness got off the phone with 911, Carrie asked her if she could take over the compressions. Well, police arrived very soon after. Karen was still ask, acting hysterical, repeating the same phrases over and over, and yelling for Carrie and Jen. Soon ambulances arrived and started rendering aid. One EMT asked for John's name and age and asked what happened. The witness said she heard Karen tell the EMT that she hit John, but that Karen was still questioning whether she had hit him, whether she could have hit him, and asking if he was dead. At one point, one of the officers put Karen in the back of his cruiser and the witness and Carrie went with her. In the cruiser, Karen asked them to pray. The witness said that Karen then looked at her hands, which had blood on them, and she wondered aloud if she had gotten her period. But they said 
No, it's John's blood. Karen responded wondering if he was dead and who would take care of the kids and asked them to promise her that someone would take care of the kids. Then they prayed. They noticed the EMTs moving John and Karen started asking if he was dead. She asked Carrie to go find out. At that point, the witness said Carrie told her to Google hypothermia and how long it took to die in the cold. The witness had her phone out and attempted to make the queries, but they never got the answers because they moved over to watch the EMTs put John in the back of the ambulance. Police ended up speaking with the witness and indicated that they'd need to talk to the homeowner, so the witness walked to the house. As she was walking to the house, she called her husband. The witness let herself inside the unlocked door, walked upstairs, and went into Brian and Nicole's bedroom to wake them up. She said she doesn't remember if Chloe the dog was in the room. She explained what was happening for a few minutes. They both got up, got dressed, and they went downstairs. Officer Lank was at the bottom of the stairs. No other officer was with him at that point. The first conversation happened in the hallway and into the kitchen and only lasted a few minutes. Her husband, Matt, arrived, and the witness said that Officer Lank told him to step aside or step outside, and they spoke. She said that Lang told her to stay at Fairview because the state police would be coming to talk to her. She noticed Carrie and Carrie Carrie and Karen leaving in Carrie's car, but they returned about five minutes later. The witness testified that Julie Albert came at some point. And Brian Higgins also showed up. Officer Lank returned to the house, this time with Officer Gallagher, because the witness had called him to come back. She had gotten his name and phone number from Julie Albert. The witness said she remembered the comments and remarks that Karen had been saying that morning. She told Officer Lank that Karen told one of the EMTs that she hit John. Now, when I heard this, I immediately was struck with, why does she selectively tell Lank that one statement, but not the others? She was specifically asked, what did she tell Lank? And she said, told Lank that Karen said that she hit John. So I have no idea what conversations went on in the interim, but she thought it was important enough to call Officer Lank back to the house to let him know that she heard Karen say those words to the EMT. After that second meeting with Lank, she and Matt went home to wait for a troopers Proctor and Buchnick to arrive. She said that she had asked Brian Albert to come to her house to provide her with support because he was like a big brother to her. When the troopers got there, they met with the witness alone in the dining room. She said that Matt and Brian were both in her bedroom. The witness was shown text messages and phone calls between the witness and Karen. The witness had texted Karen asking for Carrie's phone number because, the wit because Jen didn't have it. She also had a phone call with Karen while Karen was in the ambulance. During that phone call, Karen was still asking if John was dead. She also brought up the matter of the kids and asked if the witness would visit her. They didn't have any further communication ever. The Commonwealth ended its direct examination on that note. So this is where day 14 ended. Not many questions were answered today, although it was good to finally hear an account from somebody with first-hand knowledge of the search effort. What stood out to me from the McCabe's testimony was the family group chat where they discussed John and the directions to Chris Albert to basically get the story straight, that John never went to the house. Again, we're seeing details of the story conflict with prior testimony and official investigation reports. We're 13 days in and have not heard from the lead investigator. So that makes things a bit difficult. Also, the taillight issue is a red flag for me. The video and Jen McCabe's testimony are in direct contradiction. And I don't understand why the Commonwealth would have elicited that testimony if the video didn't support it. At the end of the day, we're no closer to getting answers about what happened to John O'Keefe. In my mind, all I have are more questions. So court will be back on Tuesday when the defense will begin its cross-examination of Jennifer McCabe, which should be very interesting. 
I hope you'll join me for my recap then. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope you have a nice weekend. Until the next drop, peace.